Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Hey, so how many are glad to be in the house today? Yeah? So let's talk about passion. You know, because when you watch Passion of the Christ, I think people have many different interpretations. And I have to say this. When, when, when uh, Mel Gibson made this movie, now I get it. Everybody has their own opinion about Mel Gibson's fall, the whole thing. But hey, man, at the end of the day, he made Passion of the Christ. We didn't, right? And that thing has changed lives globally. Globally has literally impacted so many lives. But I think that um, when you see a movie like Passion of the Christ, it's, it's amazing to see that, that they actually took the Bible and began to write the script based on the Bible. So it wasn't like it was their movie or their big idea. It was God's big idea. You want to talk about Hollywood? Man, Hollywood has nothing on the Bible. Hollywood has nothing on what God created and, and, and the stories that, that we've read through the scriptures. But I want you to know something. I think that most people have their own interpretation of the cross. If we were to uh, take a, 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 a quick inventory or if we were to interview people and say, hey, what does, what, what does the cross, what do you think the cross means? And I think most people would say this, well, the cross means sacrifice. It means that Jesus sacrificed his life for me. And how many would believe that there's a truth to that? We get that. We know that he's the lamb and he was sacrificed uh, for our sins and, and, and to save us and redeem us from a place called hell and all that. But I honestly believe that if Jesus was sitting here today and we were interviewing him, if I were to look at Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, so that's wonderful that you did this whole cross thing. How awesome was that? And, uh, and, and I see your sacrifice. I honestly believe that Jesus would probably just stop us in our tracks and, and, and gently and lovingly say, I have to correct you. I didn't sacrifice anything for you. I, I was passionate about you. The cross is the passion of Jesus for you and for me. It, I, because so many of us have made comments and statements like, I always sacrifice for you. Have you ever told your kids that, parents? Yeah, I've told my kids that many times. Like, I sacrifice so much for you so you can have a better life. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say, I sacrifice my blood. I took a whooping for you. No, no, he doesn't do that. Jesus, the reason he did what he did on the cross was because it was his passion. It's not what he did. It's who he is. And then God says in Genesis, you have been made in my image and you are just like me. So we have to understand that passion is not something that you go look for. Passion is who you are or not. We are, we are passionate people. We should be the most passionate people on planet earth, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. There should be more passion in us than anyone out there. When you look at people like John Wanglass, I love the fact that this guy, yes, he is a, a, a Academy and Emmy Award winner and all these wonderful, 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 wonderful things that he gets to have a platform and, and use all that gift for God's glory. But you know what's more awesome is that he is a a, a follower of Jesus Christ who loves reaching and saving people that are broken and lost in his industry. That's his priority. That's, that's his heart. That's his passion. And I know that because I know him personally. That's who he is. His passion is winning people to Jesus Christ. That's his passion. That's his drive. And as we were looking at this, at this movie clip, I, I, I took the guy. You guys remember Simon, the guy that, that, that was a great spectator? It's like that Christian who goes to church, and they're just always looking at what's happening in the church. Or they're always just hearing about what's happening in the body of Christ. Like, oh, wow, they're in Oaxaca now. Oh, wow, they're going to Africa. You're just hearing, right? So Simon is, he's interested in what's happening with this guy named Jesus. So he's watching from the, from, the, from, the, from the back lines and just checking out like, wow, look at this dude. Bunch of looky-loos. But then he gets called out. Simon, get over here. He's like, what? Carry his cross. I want you to carry that criminal's cross. And what was his, what was his response? Ah, oh, no, hey, I, I'm just here to watch. Don't, 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 I'm not here to be committed to help carry this guy's cross. He's a criminal. I don't want any part of this. 
And we know the story, obviously, we see that he's consumed with himself and he's just so self-absorbed and, and just, self, uh, uh, just selfish, just all in it for himself. I mean, look what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23. He says, and he said to them all, if you want to come with me, you must forget yourself. Say, forget yourself. <laughs> now say it with an attitude. Forget yourself. He said, you must forget yourself and take up your cross annually. Yeah, take up your cross annually and follow me annually. No? Uh, Carlos, my bad. Can I borrow your glasses real quick? Because I, I think I have the same eye issue as everyone else does. Okay. Take up your cross whenever you feel like it. Actually, actually I can actually look, see good with this. It's a problem. Take up your cross when you feel like it. Take up your cross weekly. Hey, take up your cross every Sunday when you go to church, and then you can say you're taking up your cross. Think about it. He said, take up your cross when? How often? And we, without even understanding or even knowing that we have become like Simon's, where Yes, we're willing to follow Jesus, like, like uh, here, walk and I'll follow you. We're willing to follow Jesus, and I want to, we want to be around Jesus. We want the blessings of Jesus. We want the healing of Jesus. We want the provision of Jesus. But then Jesus stops, and he turns around, and he says, Mauricio, pick up your cross. It's like, okay, I'm good. Thanks, man. <laughs> I mean, we want, to be, we want to be close to Jesus, but not so close that we have to sacrifice for Jesus. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Are you guys here today? Okay, so he says we are to, we are to, to deny ourselves. It, the scripture says that we are to come to the place where we forget yourself. Forget yourself. And it is, it is so hard to forget yourself because we're so consumed with ourself. If you want to be a true follower, if you really want to be legit with, with, with not only following Christ but being a Christian, you got to forget yourself. You got to deny yourself. Now, does that mean you stop taking care of yourself? No. But it does mean that you have to learn how to tell your flesh enough. You're not going to have your way. No. I mean, think about it. Have you ever been in your house? I did this yesterday. It was funny. Um, you're in your house, right? And you get up and you, you, you're, you're kind of hungry, but you're not really hungry. You just had like, you just ate like an hour ago. But you go to your fridge and you open it up and you're like, you go and you go sit on your couch, and then like two minutes later, you're back. You get back up and you go back in the fridge, and you, it's like, good Lord Jesus, I already know there's nothing in there. Why am I going back in there? Because your flesh does not want to lead you any closer to God. Your flesh wants to do all the leading of your life. It's never going to tell you, let's go to church. It's never going to tell you, let's pray. It's never going to tell you, let's open your Bible. Your flesh is always going to lead you opposite the current or the direction of Jesus Christ. That is the truth. That is the reality. I don't care how long you've been saved. You can be saved 10 years or me like me, 22 years with God. But there are moments in life where my flesh wants to take charge and not the spirit. The spirit is trying to get us to a place where we're getting closer. We're growing in our intimacy with God. But your flesh is always saying, no, you don't need that. Simon was there and he's saying things like this. He says, hey, no, I, I don't want this. I'm, I'm going to quote him on the movie, okay. So Simon says, hilarious, right. Simon says, here's what he said. Simon said, what do you want from me? Right. They ask him, come and, and, and get, pick, up, pick up his cross. He's like, what do you want from me? And it's so interesting because today you have a, a society that, that, wants, that wants Christ, that wants God. Because, I mean, if you interview the average Christian, I think over 80% in America say they are Christians. But the moment God requires something of you, then we come back and say, well, what do you want from me? Like, what? 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 Why are you? I, well, I didn't come here to be asked to do something. He said also this, I can't do that. How many times have you said what well, you can't do? We say, go out and share your faith with people at work. I can't do that. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a theologian. Come on, that's not what I do. That's, that's your guys' job. No, you can't do that, Simon. <laughs> no. 
You've been created in his image and you're like him. We are passionate. He also say, it's none of my business. It's none of my business. You know what's interesting is when I hear Christians say something like this, well, the reason I don't share my faith is because I don't want to offend anybody. Also, what you just basically said is that the Holy Bible is an offense. Is the word of God an offense? Like who am I to interrupt or even, even uh, lord my religion on you? I'm sorry. Who said it's a religion? It's my passion. Christ is my passion. He's not my religion. You know, it's not my, it's not my, my tribe. It's not my culture. No, it's, it's my DNA. It's who I am. I am passionate about Jesus Christ. Christ. I'm not here to, to say, oh, I, I'm nervous if I offend you. I don't want to offend anybody in the workplace. God forbid they get offended because I bring them Jesus. Are you kidding me? Is the gospel that offensive to you? I don't think they're offended. I think you're offended. How many were here last weekend? How many weren't here last weekend? Let me pray for you right now. I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, last weekend I was telling you the story about my bromance moment, right? Y'all remember that one? For those of you that weren't in church, um, no big deal. You're probably on vacation. Don't get, don't get weird. Okay, so I'm driving. I told you I moved into a new community, a new neighborhood, and I saw this guy. And, and, uh, and when I saw the guy, I, I, I looked inside the, uh, the garage as I was driving by. And, of course, it got my attention. And, and that's where the bromance started. Now, what was in the garage is what really got my attention. He had like five motorcycles. I like motorcycles, right? And so I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna, I got I to beeline this guy because I found a common, a common passion, obviously. This dude must love motorcycles. You got five motorcycles, right? You obviously love motorcycles. And so I said to myself, okay, I'm going to, you know, at some point go, and that's going to be my, my God assignment. Well, on Monday I did. I was driving by, and he just happened to be working on his motorcycles again and of course I you know what I got off the car and it's uncomfortable you're you're in, you're in this neighborhood nobody knows you and now you're just parking in front of someone's house and you're walking up to their garage well what do you think he said when I walked up he said what do you want that's exactly what he said to me he's like what do you want I know most of us probably been like oh nothing sir and then just take off right no I was like I was like I'm like no actually I'm like I've been driving by and just just watching you and, of course, that really got weird, right? <laughs> that got weird. That got weird. But I was like, I'm like, no, no, what, what, what's happening is I saw your motorcycles, and, man, I, 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 love, I love riding. He's like, really? He's like, what kind of motorcycle do you have? And so I told him what kind of motorcycle I have, and he just started giving me all the specs. Now, mind you, my motorcycle is old. It's like a 1980-something, uh, but it's an awesome motocross bike and everything. And he started giving me all the specs. What happened? I started seeing his passion. And then he starts telling me, and I'm like, man, I'm like, well, that's a be He's got this gorgeous speed bike, man, amazing. And, and he just starts describing and, and explaining and, and, and telling me all the ins and outs of his bikes and, and this, da, 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 and that, da, da. And I'm just thinking, like, yeah, this is it. This is awesome. And so anyways, you know what? Uh, by the end of the conversation, you know, he's telling me, well, you know what? I used to race bikes in the 80s. I was a motorcycle uh, racer. I'm like, wow. And then, you know what? We were, like, exchanging numbers at the end. And, and I'm like, man, it's a date, bro. We're on. <laughs> and you just tell me. He's like, well, what day do you go? I'm like, well, man, I, I said uh, I can go Saturday. He's like, okay. And so I'm thinking, like, man, I'm good, right? And then, he, then as I'm about it, I'm like, oh, I, that's awesome. I'll text you. We'll, we'll connect. And he's like, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm like, dang. <laughs> you had to ask, bro. You had to, I'm like, I'm, like I'm, a, I'm a pastor. He's like, oh. <laughs> he's like, okay, all right. Okay, we'll go. I'm like, okay, yay! You know, because it gets awkward. You know, when you tell people you're a pastor, it's almost like you got a disease or something. Like they don't want to, they don't want to hang out with you. But uh, listen, my my whole point is that is that you can literally you can feed off people's passion. So don't say that I can't. Don't say I have I have nothing to say. No, yes, you do. When you have Christ, everything you do, your work, what you do for a living, should be passionate. You shouldn't be lazy about what you do. 
I don't care if you're the person that says, I hate my job. Well, listen, well, then go either, either quit and go find a job that you're going to be passionate about or just accept the fact that maybe this is your season and God's trying to build character in you. And as God builds character and patience in you, then God will bless you with something more. But if you can't be faithful with the little, God can't trust you with the bigger stuff. You got to be passionate about everything you do. I don't care what you do, but you got to be passionate about it. Not because you do it, but because it's who I am. Aren't you glad that Jesus showed us that he had a job in the Bible? He was a carpenter before he was a savior. Huh? He had a job. He was a carpenter. How many think that he was passionate about his carpentry, honestly? Do you guys think that he was just kind of, just kind of, you know, half doing his work as a, car, as a carpenter? Do you think that he was building some pretty amazing stuff? How many think he built? I think so too. Well, guess what? It wasn't his job. It was what was coming out of him. He bled passion. Do you believe passion? Is there evidence of your work that there's passion? Are you, you may not like your job fine you don't like it but you got to be passionate about it or make a change or do something but you got to be passionate about everything you do he also said get someone else get someone else as I was looking at Simon and when he was saying all his things and then finally he said fine but then he goes public, right, right there. Then he, he musters up courage, like, fine, okay. But you all know they, they, they are forcing me to carry his cross. They're forcing me to carry this criminal cross of condemnation. And I just want everybody to know right here that I'm not a part of him, but I am going to do what they asked me to do. I wonder sometimes how many Christians feel like they have forced labor of serving God. Like, do you treat, treat your Christianity like, like you're forced? And I've heard Christians say, like, well, how come they're not paying me to do this? Or how come they're not doing it? It's like, are you kidding me? Like, is the gospel, are you, are you having to serve God as, as it's a forced thing? Like, you're being forced to labor for God? You're being forced to serve God? You don't, you don't, you don't get forced to serve God. It should be a privilege to serve him. And he's sitting there talking about how, how he's being forced to carry the cross. Come on. God's saying, if you want to follow me, you got to pick up your cross daily and follow me. But you have to deny yourself daily. Because our self is always going to make up an excuse on how we sacrifice for God. No, you don't. You and I, I have not sacrificed anything for God. It is an honor and a privilege that I get to serve God. I get to serve him. Look at your neighbor and say, you get to serve him. Yeah, yeah. God, God, has, God has something for everyone. I don't care your age. You can be someone that's, you know, 15 years old sitting in here or someone that's 99 years old. God, God's not done with you. Do I have any 64-year-olds any in here? Anybody 64? Any 64-year-olds? Man, we don't have any 64-year-olds in our church. Okay, I, I, we have a bold person, 64. I love it. You know what? I want you to think about this. The Apostle Paul had such a drive. The Apostle Paul was martyred at the age of 64. He was killed at 64 years old. The Apostle Paul, one of the most passionate disciples that has ever walked on planet Earth. 64 years old, he was passionate he was so passionate about his Savior. He was so passionate about his God that he was willing to give up his life for the sake of what he valued. He valued his passion and his relationship with Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 1 quickly. Romans chapter 1 verse, verse 6 because you have to ask yourself, what drives people? There's something beautiful when you see people that, that have a drive. Look. Romans 1.16 says, I refuse to be ashamed of sharing the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ Jesus. Man, Paul was like, man, I refuse to be ashamed. I refuse not to share my faith. I refuse not to, 
preach this message. I mean, do you have a, ref I refuse to allow fear to hold me back anymore. I refuse to allow uh, 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 excuses to keep me from being everything God's called me to be. I refuse I refuse to keep saying that the reason I keep doing the same old cycle, the same old thing, is because I refuse that. Now, Paul said, I refuse to be ashamed of this gospel. I refuse. No one's going to shut me up. He said, no one's going to shut me down. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to cave in. I refuse to let anyone to get in the way of me preaching this gospel. And he says, he says, because the gospel, look, it's liberating and it's powerful, and man, I'll tell you, and it's been unleashed on me. Has the gospel been unleashed on you yet? Come on, has, has the word of God been so unleashed in you that, man, you just, I'm, I'm driven by this word. This word drives me. Every day I wake up, I'm driven by the passion and the love of Christ in my life. Or are you still trying to figure that out? Are you just surviving in your Christianity? And he says, for I am thrilled. Huh? I am, thr I am thrilled, for I am thrilled to preach that everyone who believes is saved, and the Jew first, and then people everywhere. When you go to work, are you thrilled to have an opportunity to share the love of Christ, the message of Christ, the power of the cross of Jesus Christ to people that you know for a fact, you know they have no relationship with Christ? None. Do you, in the last two services, we've already had 17 people say yes to Jesus. People are just waiting for passionate people to say, there's something different about you. There's something amazing about you. He says, that's what drives me. The Apostle Paul basically was saying, I'm not ashamed about this gospel. I don't apologize for this gospel. I don't think, I wonder if I'm going to offend anyone with my message. He didn't give a rip. He brought truth, but he brought it with grace. But when he brought grace, he brought truth with it. You can't just give grace and no truth. The truth must come with grace. But the truth has to be the truth. Because it's the truth that liberates you. Anything outside of that, you're just trying to live on grace. It ain't going to work. I love grace. But truth is what sets me free. It's quiet up in this Presbyterian church. Praise Jesus. Huh? Say it with me. I won't give up. That's what Paul said. I won't give up. I won't back down. I won't, I won't shut up. No one's going to shut me up. This is my call. This is my purpose. This is God's plan. I'm going all in. Amen. Look at this. Hebrews 12, 2 says this. It says, this is, this is awesome. He says, let us keep our eyes fixed on who? On whom our faith depends from beginning to the end. He did not give up. And he wants to make this clear. Paul's saying, don't get it twisted. Jesus did not give up because of a cross. He didn't give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross. And he is now seated at the right side of God's throne. You know what? It's so amazing how many of us give up. When things get a little bit too hard. Jesus said, you know what? I, I see that I have to experience this cross. But I'm not going to let that make me quit. I'm not giving up. But what was it? What drove Jesus? What was it that helped him? That allowed him? That made him able? Gave him the ability to endure such, such horrendous pain? You know what it was? It was you and me. He had your face in mind. He had your face in mind. He had your face in mind. He already had you on his mind. He already knew you before you were, before any of us were ever born. He already saw your face. He saw Malicia. He saw Sandra. He already saw. He said, he said, it was for the joy that was set before me that I endured this cross. Do you get that? Let me, let, me, let me tell you something. Uh, 400 trillion. Can you guys put that stat for me? Look at this. 400 trillion to one are the odds of becoming a human being. 400 trillion to one. Do you understand? Can you grasp? That means that when your mommy and daddy, birds and bees, okay, 
when they were creating you, huh? when God was creating you, right? when God was forming you, not that he said, hmm, this would be a good opportunity for a Mauricio. No, for these, God said, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. That means that, dang, out of 40, 400 trillion, you made it. That means that I had 400 trillion people that I had to compete with, right, in a sense, if you were to just say it that way. And, dang, God chose me. How amazing is that? And we're wasting our life not being passionate about the things of God because we keep getting distracted with the foolishness of ourselves. Got too many Simons in the church. Just spectating. Just letting everybody else do the work. Just, I, I love you, Jesus, but don't make me carry that cross now. That's heavy. Huh? Just think about that. We quit when life gets difficult. Health issues, health issues start dealing with your body. I, you know how many people that I know that are Christians, I have compassion. That's one thing I learned about sickness. But you know what? I know so many Christians, and I've told them in their face, when they just start, woe is me. You know what a woe is me? Like they take their sickness and like every single excuse is about their health. The reason I don't do is because da, 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 da. And I say it like this. Here's why. Because to this day, okay, I'm still challenged after going through that whole Hodgkin's lymphoma mass that I had between my heart. I'm still challenged. I only have 60% of my lungs that actually work. There are times I'm up here, I'm talking, and I won't finish a sentence or a word because I ran out of breath. There are times up here where I'm preaching and I get dizzy. I feel like I'm going to pass out. Or sometimes I start seeing around my eyes a little bit of blackness. Why? Because there's a lack of oxygen. But if I allowed that to be an excuse to not get up here every single week, to study, to prepare, to do whatever it is I have to do around the world, whatever it is that God gives me, man, I am thankful that at least I have 60% of my lung capacity and I can do more with 60 than I can do with 100. Amen? Amen. Come on, guys. This isn't, to, you know, pity. This is to come on. 400 trillion out of one. Were your odds, and you made it. What's your excuse? What, what, what can you possibly tell me? You're, you're, you're not doing what because of what now? I'm sorry? You're 400 trillion. Man, you beat 400 and trillion other. Huh? Look at your neighbor. If they look confused, be like, talk. Just say to them, you're here. That's what he means. You're here. <laughs> Look at, you know, do you guys, do you guys remember uh, Charlie Chaplin? Charlie Chaplin back in the 30s and 20s, that dude was just bomb. I remember I used to watch Charlie Chaplin, you know, and I'm, and I'm only like in my 20s, right? And, but Charlie Chaplin was, was literally like his stomping ground was Newhall. Like there, a, lot of, a lot of his filming was done right here at William S. Hart Park, all around Santa Clarita. And you know what one of his quotes was? He said, failure is unimportant. He says, it takes courage to make a fool of yourself. You know what? It takes courage to make a fool of yourself as a Christian. Because sometimes you're going to try to win people, reach people, bring the message to people, and they'll think, are you stupid? Are you dumb? Like, are you one of them Jesus freaks people? And you know what your response should be like? I am. Yes, I am. Why? Because if not, you're ashamed. And if you have a passion for Christ, you're unashamed. You just can't. I mean, how is it that the world can be unashamed about what they believe, but the church is so ashamed of even saying they're a Christian believer? You may not be doing it intentionally, but your actions say otherwise. Are you here today? I mean, we got we to gotta, we gotta bring some truth here. And so I, 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 love, I love reading about different people's stories because it inspires me about, man, their, their drive. Like, for example, have you guys ever heard of a guy named Henry Ford? Do you guys remember Ford Mortar Company? Right? Well, check this out. Uh, this man here 
obviously was one of the most successful people, and Ford still continues to just blow it up here in America. But um, before he, he, he actually had all the success, he failed two times and lost everything two times. Two times he lost everything, but he didn't give up. He just kept trying, and, and then he eventually became someone amazing. Do you guys remember uh, Colonel Sanders, KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken? Huh? He always had that weird white suit and that black bow tie, right? Well, let me tell you something about that, brother. That guy had a check of $105 from his Social Security pension or whatever. He brings that, and he, and he starts preparing his, his recipe, and he presents it before 1,009 restaurants and you know what all 1009 restaurants said they said are you crazy that's a stupid idea well let's look at kfc today here we go still going strong how stupid was that and you know what their teachers said about him his teachers said you are stupid and you will never do anything huh i'm telling you there's got to be a drive what drove these people how about this one thomas edison i know a lot of you don't know who that is the lights yeah Thomas Edison Thomas Edison he failed 10,000 times in creating the the electric the electricity the the light bulb 10,000 times and they were sitting with him and interviewing him and they told him the reporter said well we see that you have you have failed over 9,000 times or 10,000 times and he didn't say 10,000 he comes back and he responds he says well you know what I didn't fail uh, over 9,000 times. He said, I just found out 9,000 ways on how a light bulb doesn't work. <laughs> huh? But what about we quit? Some didn't work. Uh, we, and we give up. That's it. It's done. Lights out. No drive. What drove this man? What drove these people? Obviously, these people were God ordained. Do you think these men just just came up being nobodies and and God didn't even know about them? God knew exactly. We don't know what what they had, what type of relationship. But I'm telling you right here that he, this guy, also was told by teachers, "You're too stupid to learn," is what they told him. "You're too stupid to learn. You're too stupid to learn." And of course, uh, we know where he's at today. And then there's this. I know this one's going to be a tough one. There's this guy named Walt Disney, and he has a place called Dis. Disney, Dis, Disneyland? Yeah. Yeah, Disneyland. Yeah. You know what they said about him? This man right here, Walt Disney, okay, uh, he was the editor for a, a huge, huge uh, Kansas City Star paper. And when they looked at him and they looked at his work, you know what they told him? They said, you lack imagination. And you know what they also said to him? And you lack good ideas. And they fired him. They fired him because he didn't have enough imagination. And they fired him because they thought, you know what? You really don't bring anything to the table, man. You always got these stupid ideas. But obviously, Mickey Mouse wasn't that stupid, was it? And all the characters that all of us parents keep spending money for to get our children to see a Disney movie. Huh? Winston Churchill. We know that he was the minister of the United Kingdom. And he did a lot of great things, obviously, during the time when he was literally the rescuer of uh, of, of, of the World War II when, when Hitler was trying to come in and do all this crazy stuff. And he, made, he had many, many wonderful quotes during his battles. But there's a few of them. You know what he said? He said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. He said cons uh, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. You know what? So many of us, we lose and we lose our passion. We lose our enthusiasm. We should be in the most enthusiastic people. Paul was so enthusiastic. I mean, there were times where he was in prison, and he was still enthusiastic. Hey, let's sing a hymn. What the heck, bro? You're we're in prison, man. What are you talking about a hymn? Right? He's deep in the dungeon. And he's telling Silas, let's start singing. Enthusiasm. Man, he's out in the ocean, man. He's just right there for three days, three nights. Just right there, just like, hey, you know, kicking back with God, talking to God in the ocean. They're leaving him to, to die. He's on a ship. The ship goes down, goes under. He's on the beach. He gets bit by a viper. What does he do? Shakes it off. Enthusiasm. We got to learn how to be the greatest shaker offers of humanity. Shake it off and keep going. Don't quit. Rosa Parks, another favorite one, last one. Rosa Parks. Amazing, amazing, phenomenal woman. We know that she was just a, a, 
a, a, a seamstress and, and just regular woman that just had an everyday job. She gets on a bus, and uh, it so happened that there was no seats left, but there was one left for, for, uh, for her in the white people section. And she sits there because she finally got sick and tired of it. And she said, I just worked all day, and we, have, we should have equal rights. And she sat on that chair and just, boom, sat there. And all of a sudden, let me tell you something. When you stand up, so does the enemy. And all of a sudden, the bus driver comes and says, ma'am, you need to get up and get off right now. You can't sit there. You know better than that. And she said, why? It's my, it's, I have equal rights. I shouldn't be able to sit. Why should color separate us? Why should color keep us from being a part of society and, and the whole story? And they said, well, if you don't, if you don't get up, something's going to happen. Now, can you imagine that in the midst of going through all that, don't you think she may have had thoughts of, of being beat or even killed for disobeying? But guess what? That woman refused to be ashamed. She refused to allow the enemy or anyone at this point to tell her that she can't sit. And we know that she sat. And today they know her as the mother of the civil rights movement. The mother, that's what they call her. She is the mother of the civil rights movement. We have to come to the place where we have to know that it's the joy that is set before me that I will endure whatever it is I'm facing right now. What are you facing right now? What are you going through? What are, you, what are you facing? Is that your final destination? Hopefully not. For the joy that's set before me. You know what? Your kids may be wacky whack right now. But how about you start seeing your kids whole and healed? The joy that is set before me, I endured him or her right now. Maybe your family's out of whack. For the joy that was set before me, I endured. I can see that there's something better gonna, that's going to come. What, what can you see beyond the now. For the joy that was set before me, I endured the cross. But that, that, that joy comes from your heart. Look at Proverbs 3, verse 4 and 5 on the screen. Look at this, or uh, verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your what? All your what? Keep reading. Okay, you guys, let's do this together. One, two, three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. And isn't it interesting how what really always affects us is what we think we know. You know, it's saying things like, I can't. That's not my business. Never rely on what you think you know. That will get you in a whole lot of trouble. That's why God doesn't speak to your head. God speaks to your heart. Your heart is where you and God make connection. I'll take it a step further. You know what? God took your heart, right? He says, I want you to lean. I want you to trust in me with all your what? Heart. I want you to trust me in, with all your heart. You know why? Because you go ahead and you put a little separation on H and a little separation on, on T. And what do you got? Ear. God wants your ear. The Bible says this all throughout scriptures. Read it. It says, and the spirit of the Lord is speaking now to the churches. Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Just because you got ears doesn't mean you're hearing anything. Y'all got ears. But many of you walk back out and you're doing the same old thing, thinking the same old stuff, acting the same old way. You got ears, but you ain't got hear. And so God says, hey, listen. I want you to trust in the Lord with all your ear. In other words, when God speaks something that doesn't reflect what you think, you know it's God. When God says forgive and your, and your mind says heck to the no, they done jacked me up, no. But God was whispering in your ear and he say, forgive. He is never going to agree with your thinking. God will only agree with his word that he's already spoken and then he'll whisper it back into your ear. You know why? Because who, so, so God, he's the father of the heart, right? You know what Satan is? He's the father of what? Fear. And fear also has an ear. Fear also has an ear. So who's speaking constantly into your ear? Fear or heart? Because the Bible says that Satan is the father of all fear. He is the father of all lies. And we have to learn how to understand that. 
I need to learn to have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. That's why when we come to Christ, you give him your heart, not your head. He didn't say trust in the Lord with all your mind. He said trust in the Lord with all your heart. Why? Because my heart is my ear. That's how I hear from heaven. Are you here today? You got to have an ear for the Father. <laughs> John 12, 49 says this. This is Jesus. The things I taught you were not for myself. The Father who sent me told me. So if God told Jesus something, what do you think Jesus was doing? Hearing. He said, I, I did what he told me, and I said what he told me to teach. <laughs> By your head, close your eyes. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.